Okay, we're going to get started. I know that um, Becky and Carissa have a lot of information to share with us today. Um, so I want to welcome Becky Lockery and Carissa Deal from Forward Service Corporation, who are going to give us an overview of transition to success and map of our dreams or map of <laughs> map of my dreams. <laughs> so um, uh, welcome everyone and Becky and Carissa, go right ahead. Hey, thank you, Anna. Much appreciated. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and just welcome everyone for coming together and um, going through this one hour of transition to success overview. Um, your instructors are going to be Becky and me. My name is Clarissa. Um, here is what we're going to be learning today. So we will summarize the TTS methodology. We will conduct a map of my dreams walkthrough and how we utilize this tool. We will discuss ways we can collaborate with each other. And we will um, talk about ways that we can best support our clients using TTS. So before we really get started, we want to know who is all attending each training. Um, so we want to do some quick introductions. If you could just state your name, title, and office location um, when you introduce yourself, that would be great. That will help us know you a little more. So we don't talk over each other. I'm going to go around the virtual room and call on you for those introductions. So I'll stop screen sharing if you want to turn on your cameras. And I'll just go through at the top of the list and start with Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Schmelzer. I'm at the Adult Literacy Center in Ozark. Actions. I just think it's important for us to um, know who's all in the room with us and, and kind of do some more connecting or networking. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the framework and the fundamentals of TTS. It starts with Dr. Marcella Wilson, the executive director and founder of Transition to Success. Dr. Wilson's life's work is um, just dedicated to developing uh, a national standard of care that changes the response to the condition of poverty as a treatable condition, not a character flaw. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and watch this video together. Um, and then um, we'll take it up from there. If you want to um, learn more about Dr. Wilson um, and Transition to Success, her website is at the bottom of the screen um, and feel free to visit that after the training is completed. Poverty is not a character flaw. Poverty is an environmental condition. And when you respond to those conditions, you improve health and economic self-sufficiency. Like slavery and apartheid, poverty is not natural. It is man-made and it can be overcome and eradicated by the actions of human beings. In the United States, we have the most expensive an extensive delivery system to help people in poverty in the world and in world history. All of these systems of care with no common language, no standards of care, no consistent analytics. The most expensive, most extensive delivery system is client driven, disconnected and ineffective. Pre-COVID, 34 million people in the United States were living in poverty. 11.9 million are children. 
They are not lazy. That is not why they are poor. 17.9 million working age adults with disabilities are not choosing to stay home and live life on the dole, as they say. And 4.7 million older adults are not freeloaders. Poverty is a circumstance, not a choice. We know children growing up in poverty, complete less school, work and earn less as adults, are more likely to receive public assistance as adults and have poorer health. High poverty communities receive less funding for public school education. And this inequitable funding for education promotes generational poverty. People in the lowest socioeconomic status are two to three times more likely to struggle with a mental health disorder. Emotional struggles for food, housing, transportation lead to depression, anxiety, and trauma. We know poverty causes illness, devastating illness. Regardless of your age, your race, your religion, your culture, if you are poor, there is a direct and irrefutable connect. But the big question is, so what causes poverty? Just as exposure to lead causes lead poisoning, and exposure to asbestos causes cancer, and exposure to pollution causes asthma, exposures to the social determinants of health is the direct cause of poverty. The science is crystal clear. If an individual, regardless of age, race, religion, is exposed to food insecurity, high crime rates, inadequate or unaffordable housing, lack of access to basic needs and resources, limited access to quality health care, poor performing schools, racism, unemployment, underemployment, and transportation issues, they will have, statistically speaking, increased rates of diabetes, high blood pressure, infant and maternal mortality, increased rates of depression, mental health disorders, asthma, compromised immune systems, compromised brain development, particularly in young children, overall higher death rates, not to mention the higher incidence of social problems like child abuse, child neglect, foster care, domestic violence, violent crime, juvenile crime, incarcerations and reincarcerations. So in a nutshell, how do you treat the condition of poverty? First, you assess social determinants, behavioral health and substance abuse exposures using the Transition to Success Life Area Survey. Second, you screen and interview. When indicated, refer to primary care, behavioral health, addiction specialists. Treat using the care plan and identify all of the supports, programs, and resources available to your client, your patient, and then help coordinate and access all those services that they are eligible for. Rescreen with whatever frequency works for your organization to assess progress and celebrate it, and also to identify other areas that may have come up that need addressing. Analyze your outcomes data. Make sure that the delivery system is adequate, and when it's not, use your data to convince the people in those positions what needs to be done. Data can drive decisions. And finally, continue TTS training in practice, organization, and community. Training in and outside of your organization in the standard of care, creating uniform language and analytics across the provider delivery system. We're not talking legislative change. We're not talking policy change. We're not even talking funding changes. What we're talking about is identifying and maximizing the existing 
funded delivery system in service to our customers. Transition to success is scalable, sustainable, measurable, and multi-generational. Anybody who was working directly with the clients, we trained them in four key evidence-based best practices. First, care management. And in this model, care stands for coordinating all resources effectively. We encouraged all of our clients to get, and we linked them to programs for financial literacy focused on predatory lending. We encouraged our clients to identify people in their own community who they looked up to, who would face the same kind of adversities that they are facing and had done well. Find a peer mentor and understand that asking for help is indeed a strength. And finally, the literature is crystal clear. One of the key best practices in addressing poverty is volunteerism transforming the needy with the opportunity to become the needed is transformational. And we use that as a stepping stone, a vocational stepping stone, when we ask the question, what is your dream? So ex for example, if the dream is to be a teacher, the perfect volunteer platform is at the school closest to your home get in the door, start learning the industry. We also incorporate accountability into this delivery system. In the transition to success standard of care, when a client approaches a delivery system provider and is met with a barrier, the TTS coach, the care manager, takes that issue up the chain until it is addressed. That accountability promotes hope in the coach working with their client. If this work inspires you, tell others about it. Don't hesitate, let's connect. My contact information is right on that slide. Let's explore opportunities, let's make introductions. And finally, if you are in a position, let's explore implementation possibilities in your practice, in your organization, in your community. All right. Thank you, Krissa. And I will take over from here and introduce you to one of the primary tools of the TTS approach, and that is the map of my dreams. So I'm going to do a high level walkthrough of this tool that all FSC um, TTS coaches are using and highlight those areas that you can potentially be part of how you fit within this community of support that we're creating as we map our clients' dreams. You'll notice throughout the workbook that there are a number of quotations. These quotations uh, resonate with a number of clients. We also encourage them to create their own quotation or find their own quotations directly related to their own individual dreams. This is the table of contents of the Map of My Dreams workbook. A lot of coaches start here as they introduce the bigger picture of how this approach works within the context of the services that they are receiving and how to get started. These first couple of pages are what I like to call the foundation, how we set the context for why we're doing this in the first place. Why are we talking about dreams? Um, a lot of clients that come into our programs at FSC get kind of a deer in the headlights, like, why are you asking about my dream? I just need a job. I just need a loan. I just need some education. And so we want to help them understand why it's so important to talk about dreams. This is their workbook. It's theirs to take with them while 
they work within our programs when they work with other of our partner agencies. So one of the first ways that I can tell you to um, how you fit in is if you're working with a, a person from Forward Service Corporation, you can ask them, have you mapped your dream? What are your dreams? And how can I help? So we encourage people to take this workbook with them when they go to work with our collaborative partners. This part of the discussion focuses on the fact that even the best laid plans can not work out as they looked in your head. Life happens and failure happens, and it's just part of the, the, the process. So we have a conversation with all of our clients talking about the power of failure and how we just need to reroute and not stop. And then we talk about famous failures. Michael Jordan not making his high school basketball team, Thomas Edison, which is a pretty famous failure. Thousands of attempted attempts before the light bulb came. Oprah Winfrey, Abraham Lincoln. Um, there are famous failure videos on YouTube that resonate with some folks. This is where some people I've shared with us actually gives them hope that if they've had some failures and setbacks in their lives, some people feel like their dreams will never come true. So having seen famous failures and that these folks have failed before they were successful sometimes is the spark that gives the clients we work with hope. We then talk about the power of we. And as um, you heard in Dr. Wilson's video, asking for help is a strength. And, for some, and yet for some people, it's really hard for them to ask for help. So we want to always be encouraging that we're their partner in this journey on their way to meet their dreams. And that we wanna surround them with people that are supportive of their dreams. We want to encourage them to build their own individual care network, their own individual strength-based circles of support. Another place that you in your work uh, in the literacy programs as our partner in our care network um, can also be part of their journey to reach their dreams. There is then an if quotation or poem that again resonates with a lot of our clients, some to the extent that they create it into a piece of art. One coach shared with us that a client she was working with created a, an artistic version of this poem, framed it, and brought it to that coach as a thank you for helping her to understand the importance of dreams and helping her set up a step-by-step -step plan on her journey to reach that dream. So this is the foundation. This is the discussion of the importance of dreams and how focusing on dreams can provide that hope, that inner motivation to keep going, uh, to reroute um, and replan when the first steps or the first activities aren't as successful as they would have hoped. And then we start talking about dreams and it begins with a simple question, what is your dream? And then we encourage people to write down as many as they can think of. Some people can't think of any. Some people fill up the pages and we have everything in between. We ask a lot of questions uh, when a client seems to be stuck without any dreams, that they can't think of them. Um, when you close your eyes and you picture something happy, what does it look like? Uh, so there are a lot of different variations if you ask that question and the client can't respond or doesn't know how to respond. We brainstorm with them. We help them identify their own dreams. Some people do dream boards because pictures um, resonate more with them than words. And you can see that we provide a lot of space for them to write down as many dreams as they can possibly think of. This is where we then support them in the support the power of we concept. How do I get there? Now I've got a whole list of dreams, now what? And the second as important question is who can help me? So Dr. Wilson provides some examples. If your dream is a home, what steps might you take? If your dream is to be a professional basketball player, what do you have to do? 
here's where Dr. Wilson in her book, Diagnosis Poverty, talks about the fact that we're not buzzkills. If someone told you that they wanted to be a professional basketball player, you could flood them with statistics about how, how highly in, yeah, unlikely that may be. Or you can simply say, that's great. Let's talk about steps. Stay in school, get good grades, practice, be drug free. We're here to map whatever dream they have. We're not buzzkills. We map their dreams. It's their dream. It's their life. We can help support them on their journey, but it is all about the client. Client-driven, dream-driven. And then the next step, step-by-step -step process. Now we have this list of dreams. Now what? To get there, I need to. So if my dream was to get my doctorate, to get there, I need to research programs that are available in my fields of interest. Who can help me? An advisor at the school that I choose. So again, step by step, layer by layer, we're gonna help them map their dream. Lots of room for them to map as many dreams as they'd like. And then we get to where am I today? And this is the life area survey that Dr. Wilson mentioned. This is what we screen for and respond to. We need to know if we need to know where we are before we can map where we want to be. And this is where we start. This is a sample of the life area survey and how it is geared as a self-assessment for the client to take. There are 19 domains, life area domains or social determinants of health, and there's a continuum. So the client goes through each domain and decides where on this continuum they fall. They write their score and then they check what's a priority for them. Here's also another important part of why this is client-centered. We're not telling them where they should start. They tell us what the priorities in their life is, uh, is or are. And then we open up our care network and say, here are some options of some resources that might help you in your priority areas. So they go through this 19 domains, food, housing, money, mental health, drugs and alcohol, health insurance, and they do that same scaling, where am I on this continuum? You'll also notice that on every page of the LAS, everything is connected to the dream. So on every page of the LAS, they write their dream, they write the date, because dreams change, life changes. On this date, this was my dream. Tomorrow or the next day, it might be different. So we continue through safety, transportation, disabilities, life skills, work, legal, childcare, adult education. If that's one of their priorities, Wisconsin Literacy is one of those uh, partners in our care network that we can make available um, as an option to help them increase where they fall on the continuum. Community involvement, support from friends, budgeting, racism and bigotry, internet access. You can see how this life area survey is a very holistic approach in looking at, <coughs> excuse me, all different areas of their life. And the way we introduce it as what might get in your way on your journey to reach your dream? And what support can I provide you to help you get those things overcome so they're not in your way anymore. And this is where we can celebrate successes. If something's a priority, we find um, we offer resources that might help them. They accomplish that priority. That's a cause for celebration. And we retake the LAS um, when significant factors happen, when they've achieved all of their priorities that they first identified. And what's the next priority? What's the next step? We then talk about life areas that are most important to them. So the important part of this workbook is that it's a guide to the discussion. It's the conversation that is so important as we help and support our clients to reach their dreams. This is an interactive, even though it's a paper document, it's an interactive conversation that clients are having with us as their coaches 
they could be conversations that you're having them uh, having with them if they are working on one of their education priorities as you're working with them and talking with them you can ask them about their dreams their workbook and how you might fit in uh, in that journey the next part of the process of mapping my dreams is that we take those priorities and those places where they checked and say, okay, let's map that. If this is your priority, what are we gonna do about it? And so they put a check on the map. They also celebrate successes in the sense that they can X off things that they're, they're fine. I don't need to be concerned about that right now. I've either accomplished it as part of our process of mapping their dreams, or they come walking in the door uh, with it X'd off and not being a priority. And then there's an example of what that map looks like. And the map takes every domain from the life area survey, puts it on this map, and then we can provide resources from our care network on the map itself. Again, the dream on every page to remind them what they're striving for, what motivates them to access and actively participate in using and maximizing all of these resources. And you'll see this is the actual map where they can fill in if they've checked it as a priority, they can access it that way. And it goes through all of the domains from the life area survey. And again, this is driven by the life area survey and where those priorities have been identified by the client. And then we get to the care plan. You might have noticed as we were walking through this that we were at pretty high, a pretty high level of resources and agencies, potential resources they can use. The care plan is where we really get into the details. The dream, the priority life area that they've identified. And you can see on this first example, apply to SNAP. What do I have to bring? Examples of what might qualify as documentation, especially for eligibility programs, where it's located, the hours, how they're gonna get there. A reminder that it may take a few hours. We want to make sure that we're providing referrals with as much detail as possible to increase the odds that that referral and that partner agency will be as successful as possible. If the client has it in their mind that it's only gonna take 15 minutes, but we know it's gonna take a couple hours, we need to make sure they know that. We don't want them to go to a resource and find out that they have an arranged enough time um, and then they have to repeat that visit. And for, especially for our clients who take public transportation, we don't want to have any wasted trips because they invest a lot of time in getting to where they need to be. You'll notice this calls school to inquire. I would call that more of a cold referral than a warm referral. Um, and we want to make sure we have warm handoffs. We could provide more detail here related to this particular task to help the client uh, become a successful, a more successful outcome um, to that referral. This is another place that you all may fit in as part of their care plan. Um, what actions do they need to take? What are their notes about what happened? Was it successful? Do I need to do a follow-up? Um, as Dr. Wilson said, we wanna hold the service delivery accountable. Um, and if they're not providing the service that they told us they would, we need to have a discussion and potentially advocate for the client with the client or help the client advocate for him or herself. So this is really the details of how this prior, how the each step um, from the life area priorities, how, what do I need to do next and who can help me? You'll notice that there are several priority areas. And then Dr. Wilson closes the loop on the workbook by reminding them 
that be prepared to reroute. Life happens. We don't want to give up. If you're going to the grocery store in your usual route, the road is closed, you don't turn around and go home, you just find a different way. You find a different path. A reminder to the, the power of we, work with your TTS coach. Remember that we're here to help you identify your own care network resources, getting the most out of every program and service you are eligible for. One of the primary questions we ask is, would you like our help accessing those resources that you're eligible for? You heard Dr. Wilson talk about volunteerism, financial literacy, make the most of the money you have. Another reminder about asking for help, build your dream team. Again, where might you fit? You might be part of that client's dream team. Some additional quotations, more tips for success. And then the journey never ends. One of the primary questions I get is, um, how do I know when the map of my dreams is complete? And my answer is, it's not. If they accomplish one dream, you move on to the next dream. We rescore the life area survey. What are their new priorities? And then we, can, we talk about sharing stories, inspiring hope, and let your journey always continue. That is the primary tool of the TTS approach. I wanted uh, to go over a couple more pieces of information and then we will um, open it up for questions. So this is our care, uh, you saw this visual in the video, all of our joint customers and clients, we wanna use these four standards of care. You're part of our care network at Forward Service Corporation. Education is one of the places that's currently funded as part of our care network. And you can see that our clients can be anywhere along on this continuum. Literacy and GED training, that might be what that priority is for that client. They're working with you, they're working with us. Let's work together and collaborate on how we can best help them reach their dreams. <clears throat> I talked about warm handoffs. We wanna make sure that we have all the information. Um, we might be referring a client to you. You may be referring a client to us. You might be referring a client to part of your internal care network, resources that you know of that can help the client reach their dreams. We want, again, that individual care plan. We wanna follow up to make sure it's working. We want to empower our clients to help them help themselves. And in summary, we wanna maximize that care network. We wanna help bring hope to all the clients we work with that they are able to reach their dreams. They are capable of reaching their dreams. And we wanna support that map. The coaches support it, other individuals like you support it, other organizations trained in TTS can support it as well. So with that, I'd like to stop sharing and get your reactions on how you think you can work, uh, we can work together, collaborative strategies, how might we use the workbook as a collaborative tool. We also, you heard Megan and Emily introduce themselves uh, as folks that work for Forward Service, we've invited them. Uh, they, they actively use the Map of My Dreams on a daily basis, so they may be able to answer your questions better um, than Chris and I. So Emily and Megan are here as well, if you'd like to ask questions related to how it's used in their daily practice. So we wanted, again, to give you this opportunity to give us um, your thoughts and feedback and answer any questions you may have. Becky, this is Anna. Can I jump in real quickly? Yes. Um, so I just want to give a, I probably could have given more background at the beginning, but I just want to kind of, now that we've gotten the kind of an overview of the tool, um, 
I want to mention to the Wisconsin Literacy Programs and any other partners that might be on the call, the reason why we wanted to organize this opportunity for us to connect was because we know that W-2 agencies, which includes Forward Service Corporation, but if you're not in Forward Service Corporation's area, um, the other W-2 agencies are likely using this tool as well, especially if they're working with refugees. And so we wanted to give you the opportunity as literacy providers to see what um, W-2 case managers are using so that you understand when someone comes to your program as a referral or someone who's already connected with their W-2, what, they, what process they've gone through at the W-2 agency. And um, so that's kind of the background as to why we thought it would be good for Becky and Carissa to be here. So I just wanted to add that in, you know, as you're thinking about your questions and your framing, you know, or, or thinking about how we might be able to um, work with um, Forward Service Corporation or the other W-2 agencies in, in using um, Transition to Success and Map of My Dreams. Thank you, Anna. I noticed one question came in chat about how long it takes to do a Map of My Dreams. Um, Megan, Emily, would what have this been your experience? Sure, I would say um, just to do like the initial walkthrough with somebody, you can do that a couple of different ways. You can do it in a group setting or you can do it one to one. Um, depends if you're using a translator or not, but I would usually say maybe like an hour or so because you're going pretty in depth, especially with that life area survey too. I agree with Emily, but I would just add that it's kind of ongoing. So like Becky alluded to, so usually in the first time I'm uh, introducing it, we'll talk through like the dream um, and then really spend the time on the survey and then um, work through like referrals. So it's just then kind of every appointment that we have, seeing where we're at and what next steps to take. I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about how this has worked when you've done this with refugee learners. I noticed in the chat box, you said you had this in different languages and what sort of strategies you'd suggest for agencies like mine who work with refugees. So Megan and I both work primarily with refugees. It's very, individual. So it kind of depends on your participant, um, whatever they need, if they might need an interpreter. I've done this with an interpreter before. Um, I would say just be patient, be very clear with what you're talking about. Um, sometimes dreams isn't always translated the best in different languages, and that's okay. Um, something that's kind of a best practice for me is just instead of saying a dream, sometimes it's something that you really want to do, something you really want to accomplish. Um, but I've also done this in like a group setting, which is helpful if you have a group of people who maybe all speak the same language. Um, you can do the instruction in English. They can have their workbook in their language in English if they want to practice more. Uh, it's really up to the group or up to the individual on what they want to do. So I have a question. Um, so I understand that there um, is at least one technical college that uses Map of My Dreams. And I'm curious how that works when, um, if the W-2 agency and the educational program are both doing Map of My Dreams, do you share that with information with each other? Or how, how, um, are we making sure as a network that we're not duplicating, like asking the same questions of, um, or going through the same process with the same individual? Right. So we, in partnership with NWTC here in Green Bay, 
they got a, a boost grant uh, to fund this project. It was a three, it's a three-year project and they are working together to coordinate those referrals and who's doing what. We've trained, so far we've trained two cohorts at NWTC. Um, so they have approximately, I would guess, about 35 or 40 trained uh, cert, uh, certified coaches. There's a third cohort that they're training in July of this year. Um, one of those coaches uh, became a trainer so that she could then train um, staff at her organization. And they they have joint meetings. It's all about the collaboration. They've, they've created a joint platform so they can share resources and experiences back and forth. Um, and it's taken a lot of work, uh, as you all know, with setting up a new collaborative relationship and especially with a grant like this where they are partners uh, in cross referrals, uh, that they are working on that communication. So a certified coach at TTS, or I mean at NWTC might start the workbook, make a referral to W2, and that coach continues the process, or it might be vice versa. So it really is all about that communication when they have those shared clients. And you mentioned before that they bring their workbook with them or that they can. Is that how that information gets transferred from um, one social service agency to the other? Or how does... And, and that also varies. Um, some clients really like their um, carrying around their paper version. Some people, I, one story sticks with me that put it in a pink binder and decorated with glitter. Um, that's how she carried hers around with her. Um, some people don't, and then it requires that uh, release of information that the whichever coach at whichever organization gets permission from the client to share that information. Um, when we went virtual, we created a fillable workbook so that, for instance, if there's a triangle appointment where the FSC and WTC and the client are all on teams, one of the coaches can pull up the virtual version, the fillable version, and during the conversation, the coach can enter the information. So, so we've gotten creative uh, post-COVID uh, to figure out how we can collaborate when there's not, we're not physically all in the same room or we're not physically all looking at the same document. So I see that Caitlin wrote in the chat um, that they use a personal education plan that has some similarities to Map of My Dreams. And so I think, um, you know, after this overview, um, the Liter Wisconsin Literacy will continue to think about the best way to partner with our W-2 agencies who are using Map of My Dreams um, because you know, to make sure that, you know, we may be doing a particular, we have certain things that we ask for, you know, as, as you do as well, as we, we work with different funding sources and um, have different mm -hmm. interests in mind. So to think about how to streamline that. And Kate, I see Caitlin has her hand raised. Right. Yeah, I was just thinking about that as well and thinking particularly about the, the refugee context of this because our refugees typically are referred to us by the resettlement agency around the same time or shortly after they're being referred to forward services, but we don't have like a ton of communication in place to know like who's enrolled at FSC and who isn't. So that might be something that we, we could think about in the Madison refugee network, like how to communicate around that since there are things that the refugee learners have talked about with FSC that would translate over well into that personal education plan or vice versa. Um, so that might be more of a coordin like a specific coordination um, challenge for, for us to tackle. <laughs> And, and Caitlin, I can, or uh, Krista, can you look up Nate Andrews' contact information? I know he's, Nate. He's, okay, so you've already yep. made that connection. Yeah, no, I know Nate, and we talk about 
clients back and forth sometimes, but we don't have like a, a system um, in place. So maybe that's a conversation to start with him. Right. Yeah. And, and Emily and Megan, can either of you address the issue of when they have programmatic types of plans and the map of my dreams and strategies you've used to make sure you're fulfilling the, the programmatic responsibility of the W-2's employability plan while you're doing mapping? I think in, in the case of refugee, maybe that's a little bit easier actually than not because the primary, a, a huge goal is always English. So, I mean, that's on their, on their W-2 plan, you know, to be working with the technical college or the literacy councils to work towards the dream. Um, and it's needed, you know, to make a lot of progress. I don't know, Emily, if you have, I feel like I'm rambling. <laughs> Um, I guess like program goals, like a lot of things that you do or that you find out when you do the life area survey are going to help you create like your employment plan and maybe your family self-sufficiency plan in my case, um, just because it brings up those conversations, I guess, with your client about their current situation and all everything. <laughs> so, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but in general, what I found, I, I'm the person that people send their experiences and stories to. And what I found um, is in what's been shared with me is that if we do the map first, in our case in W2, the employability plan writes itself. And that in our more experienced case managers who did um, during early implementation, we're doing the employability first and then the map, they've wished they had done the map first because folks where I'd identified activities and they just didn't, weren't really invested. And then when they saw how connected, when they did their map of my dreams and they had that as the driving factor about which activities to choose from, they, it felt like they were more, had more inner motivation, had more investment in actually completing the activities when they were tied to their dream. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, this is more just a specific idea that came from it. But so maybe the thing would to do would be to um, connect with folks after they've done Map of My Dreams um, at FSC. Um, and they've probably identified ESL as an area that's a priority. Um, so I'll talk to Nate and, and Becca about the timing there. There are some constraints on timing, but we can probably figure something out. But that's really helpful. Thank you. And I know we have some um, people on the call who are from Milwaukee and um, Northwestern Wisconsin. So I would encourage you to, um, as you have your local um, care coordination meetings to, especially for those of you working with refugees, to reach out to the W-2 agencies that are referring learners to you or who you know, you know, if they're getting referred directly from the resettlement agency, who you know are doing the case management for those individuals and see if there's a way you can set up, you know, some kind of a communication or referral process so that we're not duplicating. I always think back, uh, there's just a real quick story when I was working with refugees and I learned that um, when I was giving someone the best plus test, which some of you may remember. It's the way we used to test English language and it could take up to like 20 minutes with some people. And I found out that this person had taken the best plus test at two other places before taking it with me. I thought, you know what, we have to figure out a way that we're communicating with each other so that this poor person doesn't have to keep taking the best plus. And so that's why I think it's really important that we make sure that we're talking to each other. Because if we're collecting goals at our literacy programs and um, the W-2 agencies are you know, doing that as well, we may be doing it in different ways, but how can we make sure that we're being as most efficient of our, of our clients' times as they go through that? Yeah. And, and to your point on, the, on the, um, those warm referrals, if you're meeting someone for the first time, we encourage that personal connection. And a lot of our uh, forward service coaches will pick up the phone while the client's in the room or ask, ask someone to join a Teams meeting so we can make that personal introduction. 
we can have that where are we now conversation with the client. And that's another way to help to avoid um, asking the same questions, offering services they're already attached to, um, and starting um, at the, so you're all working with the client where the client is rather what, where you and your program is, are. So I just wanna be respectful of everyone's time. We're close to two o'clock. So thank you, Becky and Carissa and Emily and Megan for sharing your experience and everybody else from Wisconsin Literacies Network for sharing um, your um, your questions and your thoughts as well. You know, this is our really our first conversation around this. I want to mention that this Friday morning, there is a CARES Network meeting for um, the Wilson Fish TANF coordination um, program. I'll include that in the email I'm sending out after this call to everyone on here. That's a program that's, um, that's an opportunity for us to connect different refugee service providers. Um, and um, so we'll have a, a variety of different information in that email that's coming out. Um, Carissa just put in the chat a resource packet on um, transition to success. I will include that in the email I send out as well. Um, so are, are there any other quick questions before we close? You somewhat already answered this. You had mentioned also referring to a person's case manager because working with citizenship students, they've been in the country for a few years. Is there another place on their workbooks where maybe they might have names of people that they've worked with or would it list the agencies they've worked with on the workbooks? If they're in a collaborative relationship, it might actually be right in that um, introductory page. I'm like, my coaches are. We encourage people to write all their contact people there. It also could be on, in the care plan where they've written down um, who they're working with or who they've worked with in the past. And Anna is also going to put our contact information in that follow-up email. If there are any questions, if you want additional information about TTS, feel free to contact both, Beck, uh, both, both Carissa and myself, and we will get back to you. Great. Thank you both so much. And again, um, we will be um, sending this information out. We did record this session. Um, so if you have um, other coworkers or colleagues that you would like to send this information to, we can, you can forward that on to them as well. So thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you.